Chapter 28 of Poison Island. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Poison Island by Sir Arthur Thomas Quiller Couch. Chapter 28 The Master of the Island. But here, as Captain Branscombe leaned back and caught feebly at the main rigging for support, there appeared above the after companion, like a cognizance above an escutcheon, a bent forearm, the hand grasping a beaver hat. It was presently followed by the head of Miss Belcher, who nodded cheerfully, blinking a little in the level light of the sunset. Hello, she said, addressing Pliny, while she adjusted the hat upon her brow. Have you been telling the captain about our visitor? "'Miss Plinlimmon, ma'am, has given me a shock, and I won't deny it,' answered the captain, recovering himself. Miss Belcher continued to nod like a china mandarin. "'I don't wonder,' she agreed. "'For my part, you might have knocked me down with a feather. "'The fellow came down the creek, cool as you please, "'and pulling a nice easy stroke in Harry's cock-boat. "'Where is Harry, by the way?' "'Her eyes lit and fastened upon me. "'Good Lord! What have you been doing to the child?' "'Nothing, ma'am. He has been exploring and lost his way, that's all.' "'Hm. He seems to have lost it pretty badly. Well, he deserved it. "'But as I was saying, along comes my gentleman, "'pulling with just the easy jerk which is the way to make the boat of that sort travel. "'Good fellow was keeping watch.' They say that a sailor will recognize a boat half a mile further off than he'll recognize the man in it. But Goodfellow isn't a sailor, so that explanation won't fit. We'll say that he was prepared for the boat returning, but not to find an entire stranger pulling her. At all events, he let her come within a couple of gunshots before calling down to the cabin and giving the alarm. I had my legs up on a locker and was taking a siesta over a book, Parkinson on the dog. And by the way... We were a set of fools not to bring a dog. But I ran up the companion in a jiffy and had the sense to catch up your spyglass as I went. Goodfellow by this time had begun to dance about the deck in a flutter. He had the tinder box in his hand and wanted to know if he should touch off a rocket. I ordered him to drop it and fetch me a musket, which he did. By this time I could see that the man in the boat was unarmed, so I put up the musket at the present, got the sight on him, and called out to know his business. The man jerked the cockboat round with her stern to the schooner. These boats come right about with a single twist, and says he very politely lifting his hat, You'll pardon me, ma'am, but as you see I have borrowed your young friend's boat. My own was not handy, and this seemed the quickest way to pay my respects. Indeed, said I, and who might you be? My name, ma'am, said he, is Beauregard, Dr. Beauregard. I've never heard of you, said I. That, ma'am, is entirely my misfortune, said he, lifting his hat again. But allow me to say that I am the proprietor of this island, and very much at your service. Well, this was a facer. It never occurred to any of us, eh, that this island might have an owner. To tell the truth, I am a stickler for the rights of property at home. But somehow the notion of an island like this belonging to anyone had never entered my head. Yet the thing is reasonable enough when you come to think it over. And, of course, I saw that it put an entirely different complexion upon our business here. My dear Lydia, put in Mr. Rogers impatiently, the man's claims must be absurd. Why, the island is right in the tropics. You wouldn't have thought it a bit absurd if you had heard him, retorted Miss Belcher. He appeared to be quite sure of his ground. Very pleasant about it, too, he was. Said that few visitors ever honoured his out-of-the-way home, but that as soon as any arrived, he always made it a matter of... of... punctilio, yes, that was the word, to put off and bid them welcome. He spoke with the slightest possible foreign accent, but used admirable English. And I don't know why, wound up Miss Belcher ingenuously, but he seemed too divine from the first that I was an Englishwoman. And it wasn't as if we had come here flaunting British colours, added Pliny. But what sort of man was he? asked the captain. Height, six foot two or three in his stockings, age, about sixty, 
face clean-shaven and fleshy, the features extraordinarily powerful, hair jet black and dyed, if at all, by a process that would make his fortune if he sold the secret, clothes black alpaca and well cut, with silk stockings that would be cheap at two guineas, and shoes with gold buckles on them. I couldn't take my eyes off, no display about them, and yet I doubt if King Louis of France ever wore the like before they cut his head off. Complexion pale for this climate, with a sort of silvery shine about it. Manner charming, voice charming, bearing fit for a grand seigneur, and that's what he is, or something like it, unless, as I rather incline to suspect, he's the biggest scoundrel unhung. Oh, Miss Belcher, protested Pliny, when you agreed with me that he might have sat for a portrait of a gentleman of the old school. Tut, my dear, when I saw that you had lost your heart to him as soon as he set foot on deck, did I say of the old school? Yes, indeed, and of the very oldest, and in fact quite possibly the old gentleman himself. Now, either I had spoiled Captain Branscombe's temper for the day, or something in this speech of Miss Belcher's especially rasped it. But who is this man? he demanded in a sharp, authoritative voice. Miss Belcher stepped back half a pace. I saw her chin go up, and it seemed to grow square as she answered him with a dangerous coldness. I beg your pardon. I thought I told you that he gave his name as Dr. Beauregard. You had no business, ma'am, to allow him on board the ship. No business? No business, ma'am. I have just been having words with young Harry here over his disobedience this afternoon, but this is infinitely more serious. We are here to search for treasure. We no sooner drop anchor than a man visits us who claims that the island is his. This at once presupposes his claim upon any treasure that may be hidden upon it, and consequently that, as soon as he discovers our purpose, he will be our enemy. It follows, I should imagine, that of all steps the most fatal was to admit him on board to discover our weakness. Our weakness, sir? asked Miss Belcher, carelessly as though but half attending. Our weakness, ma'am, as it was doubtless to discover our weakness that he came. Now, I rather thought, murmured Miss Belcher, that Miss Plinlimmon and I had spent a great part of this afternoon in impressing him with our strength. To be sure, pursued Captain Branscombe, but with such a company as he found on board, he can scarcely have suspected a treasure hunt. Still, when he does suspect it, as sooner or later he must, he will know our weakness. He could scarcely have dealt with us more frankly than he did at any rate, said Miss Belcher, with an air of simplicity, for he assured us he was alone on the island. And you believed him, ma'am? I forget, sir, if I believed him, but he certainly knows that we are here in search of treasure, for I told him so myself. Captain Branscombe gasped. You? You told him so? he echoed. I did, and he replied that it, it scarcely surprised him to hear it, that of the few vessels which found their way to Mortalone, quite an appreciable proportion came from some idea of discovering treasure. The proportion, he added, had fallen off of late years, and the most of them nowadays put into water. But there was a time when the treasure-seekers threatened to become a positive nuisance, he said this with a smile which disarmed all suspicion. In fact, it was impossible to take offence with the man. But at this point, Pliny, frightened perhaps at the warnings of apoplexy in Captain Branscombe's face, laid a hand gently on Miss Belcher's arm. Are we treating our good friend quite fairly? she asked. Miss Belcher glanced at her and broke into a ringing laugh. You dear creature! No, to be sure, we are not. But from a child I always turned mischievous under correction. Captain Branscombe, I beg your pardon. Hmm, it is granted, ma'am. And, 
for I take you to be on the point of resigning here and now. Ma'am, you have guessed correctly. I am going to beg you to do nothing of the sort. No, I am not going to ask it only as a favour, but to appeal to your reason. You think it extremely rash of me to have entertained this man and talked with him so frankly? Well, but consider. To begin with, if I had not told him that we were after the treasure, he would probably have guessed it. Nay, I make bold to say that he guessed it already, for I forgot to mention it. He knows Harry Brooks. Knows me, ma'am, I cried out, as all the company turned and stared at me. He says so, and that he recognized you as you were sculling up the creek. Knows me, I echoed. But who on earth can he be, then? Not, not the man Aaron Glass, surely. I was wondering, said Miss Belcher. But, but Aaron Glass wasn't a bit like this man, as you made him out. A thin, foxy-looking fellow with sandy hair and a face full of wrinkles, about the middling height with sloping shoulders. Then he can't be air and glass. But whoever he is, he knows you. That's the important point, and pretty certainly connects you with the treasure. He didn't seem to have met Goodfellow before. Well, now, if he lives alone here, which I admit is not likely, we ought to be more than a match for him. If, on the other hand, he has men at his call, and I ask your particular attention here, Captain, it was surely no folly at all but the plainest common sense to admit him on board. He will go off and report that our ship's company consists of two middle-aged maiden ladies. I occupied myself with tatting a chair cover while he conversed. A boy, Mr. Goodfellow, whatever he may have made of good fellow, and two gentlemen ashore to whose mental and physical powers I was careful to do some injustice. You will pardon me, Captain, but I laid more than warrantable stress on your lameness. And as for you, Jack, I depicted you as a mere country booby. Here Mr. Rogers bowed amiably, and added by way of confirmation that I had known you from childhood. He will go back and report all this, with a certain consequence that he and his confederates will mistake us for a crew of crack-brained eccentrics. When she had done, the captain stood considering for a moment, rubbing his chin. Yes, he admitted slowly. There seems reason in that, ma'am. Reason and method. But tis a kind of reason and method outside all my experience, and you must excuse me if I get the grip of it slowly. I should like a good look at the man before saying more. As to that, answered Miss Belcher, you won't have long to wait for it. He has invited us all ashore tomorrow for a picnic. He charged me to say, if he did not happen to run against you as he was returning the cockboat, that he would be at the creek head punctually at 9.30 to await us. Two hours later, Captain Branscombe sent word for me to attend him in his cabin. I want to tell you, Harry Brooks, said the old man, turning away from me while he lit his pipe, that I've been thinking over what happened this afternoon. I was in the wrong, sir. You were, and I am glad to hear you acknowledge it. Now, what I want to say is this. Had affairs gone in the least as I expected, I should have held you to strict service, as we used to say on the old packets. I never tolerated a favourite on board, and never shall. But these ladies don't make a favourite of you. That's not the trouble. The trouble, no, I won't call it even that, is that you and they all cannot help taking the bit between your teeth. It don't appear to be your fault. You wasn't bred to the sea and can't tumble into sea fashions. So much the worse, a man might say. The plague of it is, I can't be sure, and after casting it up and down... I've determined to let you have your way. You don't mean, sir, that you're going to resign, said I, confounded. No, I don't. Saving your objections, boy, 
I was elected captain and it don't do away with my responsibility that I choose to let discipline go to the winds. If mischief comes, I shall be to blame, because I might have stopped it, but didn't. I was silent. This should have been the time for me to tell what I had discovered that afternoon, of the graveyard and the two strange women. But Shane tied my tongue. I saw that this noble gentleman, in imparting his thoughts to me, was really condescending to ask my pardon, and the injustice of it was so monstrous that I felt a delicacy in letting him know the extent of my unworthiness. I temporized and promised myself a better occasion. But are you quite sure, sir, that yours was not the wisest plan after all? The question is not worth considering, he answered. My policy, you would hardly call it a plan, for it wholly depends on circumstances, no longer exists. The ladies, you see, have forced my hand. I forbore to tell him that if the ladies had forced his hand, his accepting full responsibility was simply quixotic. She's a wonderful woman, said I, by way of filling up the pause. And so womanly, assented Captain Branscombe, to my entire surprise. Indeed, sir, I stammered. Well, I have heard people say, Mr. Rogers for one, that Miss Belcher ought to have been born a man. Miss Belcher? Why, heaven's alive, boy. I was referring to Miss Plinlimon. He dismissed me with a wave of the hand but called me back as I turned to the door. Oh, by the way, said he, I had almost forgotten the reason why I sent for you. This man, have you any notion who he can be? None, sir. You've thought over every possible person of your acquaintance? Well, as I nodded, we shall know tomorrow morning if he keeps his word. Mr. Rogers has kindly undertaken to stay and look after the schooner. He has a sense of discipline, by the way, has Mr. Rogers. If you wish me, sir, to stay with him. Thank you, he interrupted dryly. But we shall need you ashore. In the first place, to identify this mysterious stranger, and also to help protect the ladies. Their escort, heaven knows, is not excessive. We take the gig and if the man fails to appear, or brings even so much as one companion, I give the word to return. But these apprehensions proved to be groundless. As we rode around the bend next morning into view of the creek head, the man stood there alone, awaiting us. He saw us at once, and lifted his hat in welcome. Do you know him, Harry? asked Miss Belcher. No, said I pretty confidently, and then, but yes, in the garden that evening, the day you went up to Plymouth for the sale. Eh? The garden at Minden Cottage? What on earth was he doing there? Nothing, ma'am. At least, I don't know. He seemed to be taking measurements, and he gave me a guinea. I rather think, ma'am, he was the man that attended the auction. You never saw him until that evening? No. Nor afterwards? Only that once, ma'am. Oh, said Miss Belcher. End of chapter 28For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah. Poison Island by Sir Arthur Thomas Quiller Couch. Chapter 29. A Boat on the Beach. As we drew to shore, the stranger stepped down the beach and lifted his hat again. Welcome, ladies, and let me thank you and all your party for this confidence. The boy here, bless my soul, how he has grown in these few months. The boy and I have had the pleasure of meeting before. Eh, Harry Brooks? You remember me. To the captain I must introduce myself. Shake hands, Captain Branscombe. I am proud to make your acquaintance. But what is the meaning of these baskets? 
you have brought your own provisions come miss belcher that is unkind of you when we agreed yes surely we agreed that you were to be my guests we were not sure sir began miss belcher that i should keep my word worse and worse or possibly you distrusted the entertainment of a solitary bachelor on a desert island but i must prove that you did me an injustice he pointed to a goodly hamper on the beach and to a frail or carpenter's basket from which half a dozen bottles protruded their necks topped with red and green seals as proprietor of mortalone you will forgive my laying stress on it i may surely claim the right to do the honors stay a moment my good man he added as mr goodfellow made a motion to lift out our own hamper miss plinlimmon i believe is an admirer of natural scenery and if the ladies will step ashore for a few minutes there is a waterfall above which may reward her inspection not by any means ma'am the grandest our island can show yet charming in its way and distant but a short five minutes walk captain branscombe will bear me out and harry too yes harry too if i mistake not visited it yesterday he put out a hand to assist the ladies to disembark at the same time hitching back the gun on his bandolier you will excuse my having brought a musket you have brought your own i see quite right i carry it habitually for to tell you the truth the island contains a few wild boars who dispute possession with me a very few we are not likely to meet with one so the ladies may reassure themselves but as i was about to say with the captain's permission we will not unload here rather after visiting the waterfall i would suggest that we row round to the eastern side where if i may guide you you will find choice of a dozen delightful spots for a picnic in this way too we shall cover more ground and get a more general view of the beauties of the island which as i dare say my friend harry discovered yesterday is somewhat too thickly overgrown for easy travelling the man's manner at once frank chatty and easily polite completely disconcerted me and i could see it disconcerted the captain it seemed to reduce the whole expedition to an ordinary picnic and more astonishing yet the ladies accepted it for that they fell in one on each side of him as he led the way to the waterfall and for a climax miss belcher shook out a parasol which she had been carrying under her arm and spread it above her beaver hat at the waterfall our host surpassed himself the landscape hereabouts he declared always reminded him of nicholas pusin he would like miss plinlimmon's opinion on the rock drawing of salvator rosa a painter whom he gently depreciated had miss plinlimmon ever visited the apennines he plucked a few of the ferns growing in the spray and discoursed on them comparing them with the common european polypody he turned to music and challenged his fair visitors to guess the note made by the falling water it hummed on e natural rising now and then by something less than a semitone with all this it was not easy to suspect him of acting as it was next to impossible to mistake him for a trifler his tall figure his carriage the fine pose of his head his resonant manly voice all forbade it no less than did the wild scenery to which he drew our attention with an easy proprietary wave of the hand i observed that captain branscombe listened to him with a puzzled frown the waterfall having been duly admired we retraced our steps to the shore the gig carried a small mast and lug sail and the faint wind blowing fair down the creek the captain suggested our hoisting them i think it annoyed him to find himself appealing to dr beauregard by all means said the doctor affably it will save labor till we reach open water when i will ask you to lower them we had best use the paddles after rounding the point to eastward and keep close in shore i have my reasons for recommending this reasons which i shall be happy to explain to you sir at the proper time here he bowed to captain branscombe accordingly we hoisted sail and in a few minutes opened the view of the lower reach with the espriella swinging softly at her cables her masts reflected on the scarcely rippled water 
Miss Belcher broke into a laugh at sight of Mr. Rogers, wistfully eyeing us from the deck. Dr. Beauregard echoed it, just audibly. "'Well, well, ma'am, it is hard upon Mr. Rogers, did you tell me? But we must not blame the captain for taking precautions. A very neat craft, captain, and Jamaica built by the look of her.' "'We picked her up at Savannah Lamar,' announced Miss Belcher. "'After burning your boats, madame? Pardon me, but I find your frankness as admirable as it is unexpected. Moreover, though Captain Branscombe deprecates it, no policy could be wiser.' i see no reason sir for being less than candid with you said miss belcher you know whence we come and you know why we are here how we came is a trifling matter in comparison believe me ma'am your frankness is all in your favour i may repeat what i told you yesterday that several expeditions have come to this island seeking treasure crews of merely avaricious men mad with greed whom i have made it my business to baffle you, on the contrary, may almost count on my help, though whether the treasure will do you much good when you have found it is another question altogether. But we are not treasure-seeking just now, and I shall grudge even the pleasure of talking if it steal your admiration from my island. The shore by which we steered was indeed entrancing, and grew yet more entrancing as we rounded Cape Fee, and downing sail headed the gig for the northeast, pulling almost in the shadow of the cliffs, for the sea lay calm as a pond, and broke in feeblest ripples even on the beaches recessed here and there in the chasms. We passed Tryagan Inlet, and our wonder grew, for the cliffs now were mere cliffs no longer, but the bases of a range of mountains, broken into rock slides with matted vines, like curtains overhanging their scars and in the water, ten fathoms deep below us, we could watch the colored fishes at play. Mr. Goodfellow and I were at the oars, and we had been pulling, as I judged, for something over an hour, but easily, for the tide could hardly be felt, when Dr. Beauregard, who had taken the tiller, steered us in toward a beach, which he announced to be the, perhaps, very choicest in the island for a picnic. Certainly, it was a fairy-like spot, with white sand underfoot, green creepers overhanging, and through the creepers a rill of water splashing down the cliff. Yet we had passed at least a dozen other beaches, which to me had looked no less inviting. "'We will leave the ladies to unpack the hampers,' said Dr. Beauregard. "'I speak as a bachelor, but in my experience there is a half-hour before lunch, in which that man is best appreciated who makes himself scarce.' "'Captain Branscombe, if you will not mind a short scramble over the rocks here, to the left, I can promise you something worth seeing.' He led the way at once, and we followed, the captain, who appeared to have lost his temper again, growling that he took no stock in views. But the distance was not far. We scrambled over two low ledges of rock, and found ourselves looking down upon a beach even prettier and more fairy-like than the one we had left, and upon something more a ship's boat, drawn about thirty feet above high water, and resting there on her side. "'Yours?' asked Captain Branscombe, after a long stare at her. "'Certainly not,' answered Dr. Beauregard. "'And that is why I brought you here.'" End of chapter 29「Chapter 30 of Poison Island this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah. Poison Island by Sir Arthur Thomas Quiller Couch. Chapter 30. The Scream on the Cliff. A boat, said Captain Branscombe, staring again and slowly rubbing the back of his head. He took a step forward to descend to the beach and examine her, but Dr. Beauregard laid a hand on his arm. Not so fast, my friend. Qui dit cano dit canotier. A glance will assure you that she did not beach herself in that position, above high-water mark, still less furl her own sail and stow it. 
Further, if you study the country behind us, you will see that, while we came unobserved and stand at this moment in excellent cover, by crossing the beach we expose ourselves to observation and the risk of a bullet. I take it, sir, answered Captain Branscombe, still puzzled. You knew this boat to be here, and have brought us with some purpose. I knew it, to be sure, and my purpose is simple. We cannot have a rival party of treasure-seekers on the island. We have ladies in our charge, gentle, well-bred ladies, and of the crew of that boat, one man, to my knowledge, is a pretty desperate ruffian. The other two. You have seen them, then? Dr. Beauregard lifted his shoulders slightly and took snuff. My good friend, he answered, as Lord Proprietor of Mortalone, I pay attention to all my visitors. Well, as I was saying, to cross the beach just now would be venturesome and foolish to boot, seeing that we hold all the cards and have only to wait. What of the ladies? asked the captain. We can return at once and join them at luncheon. But the ladies, as you remind me, complicate the affair. Before you arrived, I had laid my plans to let these rascals have the run of the island and amuse me by their activities. I had, in fact, prepared a little deception for them. Oh, a very innocent little trick. I don't know, my dear sir, if it has struck you how much simpler our amusements tend to become as we grow older. I had promised myself to watch them, lying perdu, and in the end, to dismiss them with a quiet chuckle. You have read your tempest, Captain Branscombe. Well, I have no obedient Ariel to play will-o'-the-wisp with such gentry, yet I would have led them a very pretty dance. But the ladies, the ladies, to be sure, we cannot expose them to dangers, nor even to alarms. We must use more summary methods. He stood for a moment or two reflective, tapping his snuff-box. Mr. Goodfellow is a carpenter, I understand. At your service, sir. Mr. Goodfellow's hand went halfway to his waistcoat pocket, as if to produce his business card. I seem to remember, Mr. Goodfellow, that you carry a bag of tools in the boat. Yes, sir, including, no doubt, an auger, or, at any rate, a fair-sized gimlet? Both, sir. You will greatly oblige me, then, Mr. Goodfellow, always with Captain Branscombe's leave, by returning to the boat and fetching your auger, if possible, without attracting the lady's observation. With this, instead of returning direct to us, you will make your way to the left, towards the head of the beach, keeping well under the rocks, which will serve you from landward. At the head of the beach, you will bring us into sight a pace or two before you come abreast of the boat. There, at a signal from me, you will creep down to the boat, on hands and knees, or on your stomach, if you will, and bore me three small holes close alongside her kilson, using as much expedition as may consist with neatness. You understand? Then the quicker you set about it, the less will be the risk. Mr. Goodfellow touched his forelock and sped on his errand. Dr. Beauregard seated himself on the rocks, and, loosing the gun from his bandolier, laid it across his knees. A simple job, he remarked. Any one of us could do it as well as Goodfellow. But it is a practice of mine to take the smallest risks into account, and if the honest fellow should be detected, why, I imagine he can be most easily spared of the party. Mr. Goodfellow, however, reached the boat without misadventure. Ah, he displays intelligence, commented Dr. Beauregard, watching him as, before setting to work, he lifted the boat's gunwale and heaved her over on her other side, exposing the bilge piece on which she had been resting. Yes, decidedly, he displays intelligence. Mr. Goodfellow, having stripped off his coat, picked up his auger and bored his three holes very neatly. This done, he rubbed them over with a handful of sand, and smoothed over with sand all traces of sawdust, heaved the boat back so that she rested again in her original position, and retired, sweeping his coat behind him and obliterating his footprints as he went. "'Couldn't be bettered,' said Dr. Beauregard, smiling cheerfully and smoothing his gun-barrel. "'And now I think we may rejoin the ladies 
and pray that these rascals will put off disturbing us until after luncheon at one time i feared they might have taken a panic yesterday morning at sight of your schooner but they calculated maybe that the chances were all against your discovering their presence which of course you never suspected i suspected something fast enough said captain branscombe for in running along the coast i caught sight of smoke rising among the hills from a campfire as i reckoned and no doubt from here or hereabouts though i should have put it a mile or two further south the born fools said dr beauregard laughing well it's even possible that in their furious preoccupation they let the schooner come close without spying her ah captain you can hardly imagine you fresh from a civilized country where folks must keep up appearances while they prey upon one another how this lust of gold brutalizes a man when as here he pursues it without restraint and what after all will gold purchase not happiness i verily believe said the captain though to the poor and i speak as one who has been bitterly poor it may bring happiness for a while in the shape of relief from grinding discomfort yes yes as pleasure lies in mere cessation from pain but that does not meet my question we will take master harry here who seems a good ordinary healthy boy we will suppose him in possession of the treasure you are here to seek what in the end can he purchase with it better than the fun he is getting out of this expedition he can indulge all his senses but for a while only in the end indulgence brings satiety dulls the appetite takes the savor from the feast and so destroys itself he can purchase power you say but that again moves one difficulty but a step further for what will his power give him when he has won it these are questions captain which i have asked myself daily here on this island i have been asking them ever since and while i was yet a young man they came to wear for me a personal application vanity of vanities captain what the preacher discovered long ago i discovered again and of my own experience the christian religion sir began captain branscombe but here our strange host laid a hand on his arm we forget our politeness he interrupted yet gently and without suspicion of offence we keep the ladies waiting captain branscombe and i said our host as he seated himself beside miss belcher and uncorked one of the green sealed bottles have been talking platitudes to which however our present business lends a certain fresh interest you are here many thousands of miles from home on a hunt for treasure now heaven forbid that i should criticize your intentions seeing that incidentally i am in debt to them for this delightful picnic but before i help you as believe me i am disposed to help may i ask what you propose to do with this wealth when you get it why sir answered miss belcher candidly we discussed that you may be sure before starting the bulk of it after paying expenses was to go to young brooks here circumstances had given him as we supposed and for the matter of that as we still believe the clue to the treasure pardon me ma'am for interrupting you but did that clue take the form of a map of the island it did sir a map with three red crosses upon it and some writing on the back nay i will not press the question your faces answer it i ought to tell you dr beauregard in justice to the boy that he came by it honestly though in very tragic circumstances again ma'am your faces would answer for the honesty of your business as for the circumstances you speak of it may save time if i tell you that i know the whole story why truly he went on as we stared there is no mystery about it i dare say ma'am the boy has found an opportunity to whisper to you that he and i have met before it was at minden cottage in his father's garden and by the very spot where his father was murdered he found me there taking measurements for i had a theory about the crime a theory of which i need only say here that though right in the main it missed certain details of which harry's engaging conversation put me on the scent i had read of the murder quite accidentally 
but it happened that I knew something of Coffin, enough to explain his fate, and of the man who had murdered him. But of Major Brooks I knew nothing, and what I gathered by inquiry made the whole affair more and more puzzling. At length I hit on the explanation that Coffin, who had reasons, and strong ones, for going in deadly terror of Aaron Glass, had in some way chosen this Major Brooks for his confessor, and journeyed to Minden Cottage to deposit the secret with him, and that Glass, following in pursuit, had surprised and murdered the both of them. The exact catena of the two crimes mattered less to me than the question, had Glass possessed himself of the secret before making off? At first I saw no room to doubt it, but your young friend's account of himself sent me to Falmouth, and at Falmouth I began to have my doubts. My earliest inquiries there were addressed to the pedagogue, the Reverend something or other, Stimcoe, a drunken idiot who yielded no information at all, and to his wife, a lady who persisted in regarding me as sent from heaven for no other purpose than to discharge her small debts. From her, again, I learned nothing." but from a talk with one of her pupils, his name was Bates, if I remember, I discovered that Master Harry had been a particular crony of Coffin's, and this, of course, threw light on Coffin's visit to Minden Cottage. Still, there remained the question, had Glass managed to lay hands on the chart, or had it found its way, after all, into the possession of Master Harry Brooks? You'll excuse me, young sir, Dr. Beauregard turned to me, but during our talk in the garden, your manner suggested to me that you had a card up your sleeve. Well, whatever the answer, my obvious course was to return to Mortalone and await it, as for fifteen years already I have been awaiting it, though question and answer, but were now beginning to take definite form. Here you are, then, at last, and here am I. Tout fiant a point, a qui c'est attendre. "'Then our arrival, sir, did not altogether surprise you,' said Miss Belcher. "'On the contrary, ma'am, though for reasons you will not easily guess. "'It surprised me, as I have never been surprised in all my life before. "'It confounded me, dumbfounded me, made chaos of my plans. "'And—and and I am delighted to welcome you, ma'am. "'I desire to be allowed the honour of taking wine with you.' Willingly, assented Miss Belcher, holding out her glass to be replenished, and the more so because I never drank better Rhone wine in my life. Dr. Beauregard stood up and bowed, his fine features overspread with a flush of pleased astonishment. Madame, began Dr. Beauregard, and I have no doubt he had a compliment on his lips, but at that moment the hills and the amphitheater of cliff behind us rang out, rang out and echoed, with two terrible screams. End of chapter 30 Chapter 31 of Poison Island This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah. Poison Island by Sir Arthur Thomas Quiller Couch. Chapter 31. Aaron Glass. The second scream followed the first, almost before we could lift our faces to the cliff. Dr. Beauregard had risen to his feet, quickly, without fuss, and was unstrapping his gun. But Miss Belcher was quicker. A couple of muskets lay on the sand close beside the luncheon cloth, and in a trice she had snatched up one of them and held our host covered. "'You have deceived us, sir,' she said quietly. Dr. Beauregard looked along the barrel and into her eyes with an admiring, half-quizzical smile. "'Good,' said he. "'Good, but unnecessary. That the island is inhabited I supposed you to know, since Captain Branscombe tells me he reported catching sight of smoke yesterday when off the western coast. But the fellows, there are or were three of them, by the way, are no friends of mine. We have only your word for it, said Miss Belcher, without lowering her musket. True, ma'am, the doctor assented with a bow. 
I am about to give you proof. But first of all, oblige me by listening for another moment. He held up his hand, and while we all listened, I looked around from face to face. Captain Branscombe had unslipped his gun and stood eyeing the doctor with a puzzled frown. Pliny stared up at the cliffs. She was white to the lips, but the lips were firmly set, whereas Mr. Goodfellow's jaw hung as though loosed from its tacklings. So we waited for twenty seconds, maybe, but no third scream came down from the heights. That makes one accounted for, said Dr. Beauregard. I have known, first and last, eleven parties who hunted treasure on this island. They all quarreled. They quarreled, moreover, every one of them, before getting their stuff, such as it was, to the boats. Now, if you will permit me to say so, your own success, when you obtain it, will be a fluke, and an absurd fluke. It will stultify every rule of precaution and violate every law of chance. I have studied this game for close upon twenty years and reduced it almost to mathematics, and I foresee that you will play, nay, you have already played, nine pins with my most certain conclusions. But you have, as gentlefolks, with all the disabilities of gentlefolks, the one thing that all these experts have fatally lacked. You have self-command. It appears to me that we need it, at any rate, said Mrs. Belcher tartly, if we are to be favored just now with a lecture. Dr. Beauregard smiled. The purport of my lecture, ma'am, was to prepare you for a question which I have to put. When these men arrive, Captain Branscombe, Mr. Goodfellow and I must deal with them. Are you ladies prepared to exercise strong self-control? Will you, with Harry Brooks, await us here until our business is over? Excuse me, sir, but I must first know what your business is. That, ma'am, will depend upon circumstances, but it is more than likely to be serious. I must trouble you now and always to speak to me definitely. If you propose to shoot these men, kindly say so. I do not, ma'am, but their boat lies on the next beach, and as soon as they launch her, they will discover us, and as soon as they discover us, it will be life for life. But they need not discover us. In five minutes we can embark ourselves and our belongings. In less than fifteen we can round the point to the southward, and beyond it lie two or three small coves where, as I judged in passing, a boat can lie reasonably safe from observation. Admirably reasoned, ma'am. By all means take the boat. Take Harry Brooks with you, and Mr. Goodfellow for protection. But Captain Branscombe and I must stay and see it out with these men. For my part, put in Pliny, I cannot see why these men have not as much right as we to the treasure. And in any case, if we let them go, they leave us a clear coast to hunt for the rest. Captain Branscombe, Dr. Beauregard turned to him. Do these ladies, as a rule, assert a voice in your dispositions? They do, sir, answered the captain, with a tired smile. And if you will take my advice, the only way with them is to make a clean breast of everything. I will. The doctor faced about with a smile. You must know, then, ladies, that these two ruffians— for by this time there are two only, will presently be coming down to the next beach to launch their boat and leave the island. How do I know this? Because my study of treasure hunters has given me a kind of instinct, or because, if you prefer it, I have observed that the moment, the crucial moment, when these fellows quarrel is always the moment when, having laid hands on as much as they can carry, they turn to retreat. "'You doubt my diagnosis, ma'am?' he asked, turning to Miss Belcher. "'Then I can convince you even more simply. "'These men are not camping here tonight. "'They will not return tomorrow to fetch a second load, "'and for the sufficient reason that there is no second load. "'I know the amount of treasure hidden where they have been searching. Two men can lift and carry it easily.' "'How do you happen to know this?' asked Miss Belcher, eyeing him from under contracted brows. For the excellent reason, ma'am, 
that i put the treasure there myself the answer staggering to the rest of us seemed to brace her together she had lowered her musket at the beginning of the discussion but now throwing up her head with a sharp jerk she leveled her eyes on dr beauregard's as straight as though they looked along a gun barrel then it can hardly be for the sake of the treasure sir that you propose to deal with these men it is not ma'am nor solely to protect us from them since you have brought us here where we need never have come no ma'am i brought you here because i cannot be in two places at once and it was necessary to keep both parties under my eye having brought you i am bound to protect you but my main business here and yours or at any rate captain branscombe's is to punish to punish but why to punish dr beauregard hesitated with a glance at pliny and at me who stood beside her a word in your ear ma'am if you will allow me he stepped close to miss belcher and spoke a sentence or two which i could not catch but my eyes were on her face and i saw it change color the next moment her square mouth shut like a trap if that be so i wait for him along with you she announced oh you may trust me sir i have a fairly strong stomach with criminals and no sentiment it shall be as you please ma'am but for the others i would suggest their taking the boat and awaiting us around the point see the tide has risen and within five minutes she will float mr goodfellow will you accompany miss plinlimon and the boy wait please until completely afloat before pushing off for our friends must be near at hand by this time and the grating of her keel might give them the alarm for the same reason ma'am unless you have any particular question to ask we had best start at once and when we have started keep the strictest silence shall i lead the way they set off very cautiously the doctor leading miss belcher close at his heels captain branscombe a couple of paces behind her gained the ridge and passed out of sight around an angle of the rocks now to be left in this fashion was not at all to my mind it seemed to me that when serious business was on hand every one conspired to treat me as a baby i had told captain branscombe yesterday that i would not put up with it and though i stood in far greater awe of dr beauregard than of the captain i felt none the less mutinous now pliny who in moments of agitation invariably had recourse to some familiar work for a sedative was on her knees repacking the luncheon baskets her back was turned to me and from her i glanced towards mr goodfellow who had stepped down to the boat and was leaning over the gunwale to rearrange the gear from him i looked up to the beach to the ridge behind which the others had disappeared and to the creepers overhanging the cliff suddenly it came into my head that by gaining the upper edge of the ridge where it met the cliff i could wriggle under these creepers and observe from behind them all that went on as well on the next beach as on this and with another glance at pliny's back i tiptoed away i moved as swiftly as i dared making no noise nor looking behind me until i reached the rocks under the cliff the path by which mr goodfellow had crept round to scuttle the boat i calculated that by working my way along for fifty yards between them and the rock face i should gain an opening which observed from below had seemed to promise me an excellent view of the next beach but they hung so heavily that i found myself struggling in an almost impenetrable thicket and when at length i gained the opening and drew breath above the splash of waves on the beach i heard a sound which caused me to huddle back like a rabbit surprised in the mouth of its burrow some three yards from my hiding the bank of low cliff bounding the beach shelved upward and inland in a stretch of short turf and from the head of this slope came the thud of footsteps of heavy footsteps descending closer and closer i drew back under the creepers and held my breath between their thick woven strands my eyes caught only to the right a twinkle of the sea in front a yard or two of white shingle glittering beyond the green shade and five seconds later 
This patch was blotted out as two men plunged past my spy hole. They walked abreast and carried a box between them. I could hear them panting so closely they passed. They halted on the edge of the bank. The boat's all right, said one, and I heard him jump down upon the shingle. It seemed to me that I knew his voice. Here, pass down the blamed thing. Damn it all, man! I can't, whispered the other. So help me, Bill, I can't. I'm not used to it, and I ain't got the nerve. Nerve, and you call yourself a seaman, and a plucky lot you boasted the night we signed articles. Nerve, why, you was the very man to find fault with him. Couldn't stand his temper another day, you said, and must do something desperate. Those were your very words. I know it. I didn't think. Oh, to hell with your didn't think. The man's dead, and cryin' won't bring him back. Much you'd welcome him if he did come back. Don't, Bill. Now look you here, Jim Lucky. Stand you up and help me get this lot in the boat, and the boat to sea. After that you can lie quiet and cry yourself sick. You'll be all right tomorrow, fit as a fiddle. I've been in this business before, and see how it takes men, even the strongest. It's the sight of blood, but the stomach gets accustomed. By this day week you'll be lively as a flea in a rug, and looking forward to driving in your carriage and pair. I promise you that. But what you've to do at this moment is to stand up and help me get down the boat, for if he's anywhere on this island, God help the pair of us. He, quavered Jim Lucky, I shouldn't wonder. But you told me he was dead. Did I? Well, perhaps I did. That was to keep your spirits up. But now I don't mind telling you that I'm not sure. He ought to be dead by this time. But tis a question if the likes of him ever die. He's own cousin to the devil, I tell you. And if he's anywhere alive, like as not, he's watching us at this moment. Whatever this meant, it appeared to rouse Jim Lucky and start him in a panic. I heard him sob as he helped to lower their burden upon the beach. All this time they had been standing immediately beneath me, and I dared not lift my head for a look. But now, as they went staggering down the beach, I parted the creepers and stared in their wake. They carried a heavy sea chest between them, but my eyes were neither for the chest nor for Jim Lucky, but for his companion, the man he called Bill. I knew him before I looked, and as I had recognized his voice, so now I recognized his narrow, foxy head and sloping shoulders. It was Aaron Glass. The two men carried the chest along at a rate that perhaps came easily enough to Jim Lucky, who was a young giant of a seaman, but was astonishing for a thin, windle straw of a man such as Glass. He plowed his way across the sands like a demon, and had scarcely set down the chest a little above the water's edge before he was tugging at the boat. I heard him call to Lucky to help, and the pair heavy hoed together as they strained at the gunwale to lift her and run her down. From this ridge as yet came no sign. Presently from the boat they had pulled her down to the water and were both stooping over her with their shoulders well inside, busy in arranging her bottom board, I heard a fearful oath, an oath that rose in a scream as the two men faced each other, scared, incredulous. Scuttled, by God! It was Glass who screamed it out, and with the sound of it a host of seabirds rose from the neighboring rocks, whitening the sky. But Jim Lucky cast up both hands and ran. Stop, you fool, stop! I think the poor creature had no notion whither he ran, that he was merely demented. But, in fact, he headed straight for the ridge, not turning his head. Twice Glass called after him, then, in a sudden fury, whipped out a pistol and fired. For the moment I supposed that he had missed, for the man ran for another six strides, without seeming to falter. Then his knees weakened, and he pitched forward on his face. I believe, on my word, that Glass had either fired in blind passion or with intent to stop the man rather than to kill him. He stood and stared, and while the pistol yet smoked in his hand, I saw Dr. Beauregard step forth from his shelter, 
stepped delicately past the corpse and raised his musket and heard his clear, resonant voice call out, Both hands up, Mr. Glass, if you please. End of chapter 31 Chapter 32 of Poison Island This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah. Poison Island by Sir Arthur Thomas Quiller Couch. Chapter 32. Welcome to Dr. Beauregard's house. Glass's arm fell limp by his side, as though Dr. Beauregard had actually pulled the trigger and winged him. He turned half about as the pistol slid from his fingers. He gave no cry, only there leached us a loose, throttling sound, such as a steam whistle makes, before fetching its note. It came to us in the lull between two waves that broke and raised up the sands to ripple round his feet. Both hands up, Mr. Glass. Dr. Beauregard advanced a step, but instead of lifting his arms, the man curved them before him and held them so as if to protect his treasure while he sank on his knees beside the box. His face was yellow with terror. "'You fool!' The doctor, still holding him covered, advanced step by step to the box and bent over it, staring down at him. The rest of us, that is to say, Miss Belcher, Captain Branscombe and I, under I not know what compulsion, followed and came to a halt a few paces behind him. Standing so, I felt, rather than saw, that Pliny and Mr. Goodfellow, attracted by the report of the pistol, were peering at us over the ridge of rocks on the right. "'You fool!' Dr. Beauregard repeated, and suddenly dropped the butt of his musket upon the loose cover of the chest. "'You fool!' said he a third time, and tearing aside a splintered board, dipped his hand and held it up full of sparkling stones. Opening his fingers slowly, he let a few jewels rattle back upon the heap and held out a moderate fistful towards the cowering glass. Did you actually suppose, having proved me once, that I would suffer such a common cutthroat as you to march off with my treasure? Look up at me, man. I charge you with having murdered Coffin even as you have just murdered that other poor blockhead who trusted you. He nodded sideways, but still keeping his eyes upon glass, towards the body which lay as it had fallen. Answer me. Are you guilty? Yes or no? The man's mouth worked, but his tongue crackled in his mouth like a parched leaf. Yes, I know what you would say, that you had some excuse— that Coffin, in his time, had stuck at nothing to be quit of you, that he sold you to the press gang, that through Coffin you spent eight, ten, how many years, in the war prisons, that he believed you dead, as he had taken pains to kill you. Well, we'll grant it, as between two scoundrels I'll not trouble to weigh the rights against the wrongs. But look at this boy here. You recognize him, hey? I charge you with having murdered his father, Major Brooks, as you murdered Coffin. You have run up a pretty long account, my friend, for so clumsy a performer, but I think you have reached the end of it. Aaron Glass looked at me and blinked. Terror of the man confronting him had twisted his dumb mouth into a kind of grin horrible to see. It lifted his lip like the snarl of a dog, over his yellow teeth. Dr. Beauregard laughed softly. And all for what? For an imperfect chart, and for these. He thrust his hand close up to Glass's face and spread his fingers wide, letting the gems drip between them and rain back into the treasure chest. What's wrong with them? That's what you'd be asking, eh? If your poor tongue could find the words. Well, only this, my friend. Yes, look well at them, that I hid them myself, and every one of them is false. 
false i could see glass's mouth at work his lips forming to the echo of the word as it struck across his terror like a whip but he achieved no articulate sound i give you my word resumed dr beauregard but a thud interrupted him glass had fallen forward in a faint striking his forehead against the edge of the chest and lay face downward with the blood oozing from his temple and discoloring the sand as the doctor paused and bent over him another wave came rippling up the beach throwing a long thin curve of foam before it and washed out the stain is is he dead i heard pliny's voice quavering not yet ma'am answered the doctor grimly and taking the inanimate body by the collar he drew it above reach of the waves and turned it over you are a doctor sir yes ma'am and have some small skill he put up a hand to his breast pocket half withdrew it and hesitated you have balked me of a pretty little scheme he said quietly and still while he addressed us he seemed to be considering think of this fellow's face when he got his treasure across to the mainland and attempted to trade it to be sure he gave us some fun for our pains if you call it fun sir protested pliny well yes ma'am he answered quietly kneeling and lifting glass's head and resting it across his thigh my humor may be of a primitive sort but i confess it tickled by shocking a murderer into a fainting fit he felt in his breast pocket and drew forth a small file no sir he turned to captain branscombe who had stepped forward to offer his help let me alone please i prefer to treat my patient in my own way it will be best on the whole for everybody he forced glass's mouth wide open and with one hand poured about half of the contents of the phial between the patient's teeth drop by drop very patiently with the other smoothing the gullet between finger and thumb we all stood watching while he administered the dose miss belcher close beside me with her hand on my shoulder at the twentieth drop or so i felt her give a start as though a thought had suddenly occurred to her and i looked up into her face her eyes were fixed inquiringly on dr beauregard and he happening also to look up met them with a smile you will see in a moment he said as if answering her thought and reaching forward he laid two fingers on glass's pulse yes in a moment now sure enough in a moment glass's eyelids fluttered a little and he came back to life with an audible catch of the breath in two minutes time sir the doctor turned to captain branscombe i shall be glad of your services and of mr goodfellow's to carry the fellow down to the boat that is to say if in deference to the ladies you have really decided not to leave him here to his fate he will sleep after this nay if you will listen he is sleeping already the other man is dead i suppose he must have died instantly answered captain branscombe who had stepped across to the body to assure himself i had no doubt of it by the way he dropped well there is no need to fetch a spade their thoughtfulness provided one you will find it in the boat there half an hour later we embarked leaving behind us on the beach a scuttled boat a mound of sand and a chest of false jewelry over the top of which the rising tide had already begun to lap aaron glass lay along the bottom boards asleep and breathing apoplectically i pulled the stroke paddle mr goodfellow the bow and the captain steered dr beauregard addressed himself to the ladies of whom miss belcher sat with a corrugated brow as though turning a thought over and over in her mind and pliny with scared eyes staring into vacancy i am sorry indeed ladies said the doctor that i could not have spared you this the fool shot his mate you saw it yourselves without rhyme or reason against madness and the impulses of madness no man can calculate i might plead too that in an undertaking like this you match yourselves against forces 
with which it is not given to ladies to cope. I grant admiringly the courage that brought you across thousands of miles to Mortalone, as I grant, and again admiringly, the steadiness of your behavior this afternoon. But one thing you did not know, that in the nature of things you were bound to meet with such men and see such things done. I have not lived besides treasure all these years without learning that it attracts such men as carrion attracts the vultures. Hide it where you will. From the end of the earth some bird of prey will spy it out, or at least some scent of it will lie and draw such prowlers as this fellow. Dr. Beauregard touched the sleeping man contemptuously with the toe of his boot. I myself have been, shall we say, fortunate. I have emptied, or assisted to empty, two caches of treasure in this island. A third remains, of which you have the secret, and I believe it to be the richest of all. But before you attempt it, I have a mind to tell you something of the other two, that at least you may not attempt it unwarned. You may spare yourself the pains, sir, said Miss Belcher decisively, since our minds are made up. You might, I doubt not, succeed in frightening us, but since you will not deter us, I suggest that the less we hear, the better. The doctor bowed. Ah, madame, sighed he, if only fate had timed your adventure two years ago, or if, departing with the treasure, you could even now leave me to regrets in peace. My good sir, said Miss Belcher sharply, I haven't a doubt you mean something or other, but what precisely it is I cannot conceive. You will go, madame, leaving my island twice empty. That is fate, and I consent with fate. But the devil of it is, ma'am, if I may use the expression, your removing the treasure will not prevent others coming to look for it, and annoying an old age which has ceased to set store on wealth or on anything that wealth can purchase." She looked at him oddly. Well, now, she confessed, you are a mystery to me in half a dozen ways, but if on top of all you mean to turn pious, he laughed, and when the laugh was done, it seemed to prolong itself inside him for fully half a minute. You are right, ma'am. Let us be practical again, and as the first practical question, let me ask you, or Captain Branscombe, what you propose to do with this man. Obviously, we cannot take him along with us after the treasure. Well, I imagine we are returning to the schooner. He can be left on board, in charge of Mr. Rogers. But I was about to suggest that we take Mr. Rogers along with us. In some ways, he is the most active of the party, and we can hardly spare him. Of good fellow, then, or whomsoever Captain Branscombe may appoint to take charge of the ship. The doctor sat silent, as though busy with a thought that had suddenly occurred to him. After a minute, he lifted his head and threw a quick glance upward at the sky. "'The breeze is freshening again, Captain,' he announced. "'If you care to hoist sail, the rowers can take a rest, at least until we reach Cape Fee.' Captain Branscombe gave permission to hoist sail, and soon we were running homeward with as much as we could carry. There was no danger, however, for beyond the northern point of Try Again Inlet, the water lay smooth all along the shore. Dr. Beauregard here called on Plenty to admire the scenery, and borrowing her sketchbook and pencil, dashed off a bold drawing of Cape Fee as, rounding a little to the westward, we caught sight of it standing out boldly against the afternoon sun. As he drew it, he guided the talk gently back to ordinary topics, to England and English scenery, to the charm of English domestic architecture, and particularly of our great country seats, to gardens and gardening, of which he professed himself a devotee. Ah, he sighed at length, drawing a long breath, if you, my friends, only knew how much of what is happiest in life you carry in your own breasts. I used, forgive me, to laugh at such pleasures as I am enjoying at this moment. I see that nothing but gaiety and a simple heart 
can bring a man peace at the last. And now it is too late to begin. Pliny, not understanding in the least, opened wide eyes upon him. His tone seemed to ask for her pity. Yes, yes, I have sought hard for pleasure and grudged no price for it, but the stuff I bought was all flash and sham, like this fool's diamonds, flash and sham, and the end of it weariness. Well, there is money left. You shall take it, and endow a hospital if you choose, and that no doubt will increase your happiness and make it thrive. But the root of the plant lies within you. Pardon me, ma'am, he looked towards Miss Belcher. The question sounds an impudent one. I know, but are you not, even for England, a well-to-do lady? I have a trifle more than my neighbors, owned Miss Belcher, but it's almost more plague than blessing. At least I call it so, sometimes, which is a different thing from being ready to give it up. And you, ma'am? He turned to Pliny. I have enough for my needs, I thank God, she answered, but I have known what it is to be poor. Quite so, he nodded, and yet you have come thousands of miles, you two, in search of treasure. At the entrance of Gow's Gulf, we downed sail and took to our paddles again. The tide helped us against the breeze, and within half an hour we came in sight of the schooner lying peacefully at anchor as we had left her. So at least, and at first glance, it seemed. But as we drew near, Captain Branscombe stood up suddenly, the tiller lines in his hands. Hello! Where's the dinghy? It was gone, and what was worse, our repeated hails fetched no answering hail from the ship. But just as we were beginning to feel seriously alarmed, a voice shouted from the opposite shore, and Mr. Rogers came sculling out from the shadow of the woods, working the dinghy towards us with a single paddle over stern. "'Sorry, Captain,' he hailed. Two deserters in two days. Oh, we're a cheerful team to drive. But I have my excuse ready. The fact is—' Here, catching sight of Dr. Beauregard, Mr. Rogers stopped short. "'I fancy,' said the doctor, amiably, turning to Captain Branscombe, your friend has not his excuse so ready as he supposed. Doubtless he'll impart it to you later on. Meanwhile, I would suggest that we take him along with us. But where are we going? asked Captain Branscombe. To my house. Ah, it is news to you that I have one. You supposed, perhaps, that the Lord Proprietor of Mortalone roosted at night in the trees? But where, in that case, would he stack his wine? My dear sir, I have a house, and cellarage, to the both of which you shall be made welcome. Even if you decline my hospitality, we have the invalid here to dispose of, and surely you won't condemn a man of my years to carry him home pick a -back. But the schooner, I give you my word of honor, sir, that your ship shall not be visited nor tampered with in any way. Return when you will." you shall find her precisely as she lies now. In another two hours, even this faint breeze will have died down, as you are seaman enough to know. The anchorage is landlocked, the bottom is perfect holding, and as for unwelcome visitors, there can be none. I am the sole resident on this island. I looked up at Dr. Beauregard sharply, and so, it seemed to me, did Mr. Rogers, who had fallen alongside. That is to say, continued the doctor, quietly, without regarding either of us, the only male resident. All the same, I don't like it, persisted the captain, and shook his head, at the same time lifting his eyes towards Miss Belcher. And it's clear against my rule. Stuff and nonsense, said Miss Belcher. We ought to be grateful to Dr. Beauregard for taking this creature glass off our hands. I was thinking a moment ago that for a thousand pounds I'd rather he was anywhere than on board our ship. The least we can do is to bear a hand with him, and if we don't like the house we can come away. And before nightfall, if you insist, added Dr. Beauregard genially, but the afternoon is young, and between now and nightfall you may all have major fortunes. 
Who knows? Captain Branscombe yielded, after a look at Pliny, who backed up Miss Belcher, declaring herself ardent for new adventures. I began to see that the captain was wax in the hands of these two, and it puzzled me, who had some experience of him, both in school and on shipboard. Instead, then, of heading for the ship, we rode past her and up the creek, Mr. Rogers following in his dinghy, and disembarked at the landing place under the green knoll. While Dr. Beauregard and Mr. Goodfellow lifted out Aaron Glass, and while the captain explained to Mr. Rogers where and how we came by such a passenger, I stared about me, wondering where the doctor's house might be and where the approach to it. For I remembered the narrow gorge leading up to the waterfalls and the thick, precipitous woods on either hand, and how such a party as ours, including two ladies and a sick man, could hope to penetrate these woods or climb those waterfalls was a puzzle. In ten minutes, Mr. Goodfellow had patched up a fairly serviceable litter with the boat's sail and a couple of paddles. Dr. Beauregard bestowed the patient in it carefully enough, and when all was ready, led the way. The two carriers, Mr. Rogers and Mr. Goodfellow, came next with the litter between them, and at a nod from the former, I fell in beside him. The captain and the two ladies brought up the rear. Harry, whispered Mr. Rogers, as we wound our way round the knoll, is this really the man who— This is Aaron Glass, I said. He stared down, for he carried the hinder end of the litter upon the villainous, unconscious face. He looks a pretty bad one, said Mr. Rogers, after a pause. You should have seen him on the beach, said I. I've seen something myself, said he. Closer, boy. There was a woman came down to the shore just now, waving to the ship and crying. At first I took her for a child. She was dressed all in white, white muslin and ribbons, you know, the sort of rig you see at a children's party. But when I rode over close to her, I know her, I said. I met her in the woods yesterday. That explains, though I call it an infernal shame you didn't tell. I rode across to find out what ailed her. She stood waving her arms so and crying, like a child in distress. When I came near, she called on me to stop. Not you, she said, the little boy. Where is the little boy? I told her that we had a boy on board, but that just now you were off on a cruise, and with that she turned right about and ran up through the woods and out of sight. But for some way I could hear her crying and calling out just as before. The little boy, it was. Where is the little boy? Meaning you, I suppose. We were now come to the foot of the first waterfall, an obvious cul-de-sac for a party which included two ladies and a sick man on a litter. I stood gazing up at the wet, slippery rocks by which I had made my ascent yesterday and searching in vain for a more practicable path. Dr. Beauregard halted and turned upon me with a smile. A moment, said he, and you will grant that my privacy is rather neatly protected. But first, he pointed to the water pouring past us from the pool beneath the fall. You may remark that the stream here has more than twice the volume of the stream you see coming down the rocks. I looked. The difference was plain enough, and I had been a fool in failing to observe it. The reason being, he went on, that a second and larger stream flows into the pool under the very stones on which you are standing. I myself laid that channel for it almost ten years ago, and nature has very kindly helped to disguise it. Now, if you will follow me. He drew aside a mat of creepers overhanging a bush to the left of the path, and, stooping, disappeared into a dim green tunnel so artfully contrived that even without its curtain of creepers it suggested no more than a chance gap in the undergrowth. The tunnel zigzagged twice at a sharp angle, and then, quite suddenly, the dimness changed to warm sunlight, and we emerged at his heels upon a prospect that well excused my gasp of astonishment. We stood at the lower end of a smooth green glade, 
through which a broad stream, a river almost, came swirling, its murmur drowned in the thunder of the waterfall behind us, which the bushes now concealed. The glade was, in fact, a valley bottom, thinned of undergrowth and set with tall trees, and the stream such a stream as tumbles through many an English deer park. The whole scene might have been transplanted from England, but for a wall of naked cliff, sharply serrated, which enclosed the valley on the left, and under it, like a smooth military terrace at the foot of a fortress, the glade curved upward and out of sight. The scene, I have said, was almost typically English, but to the eye only. Fa! exclaimed Miss Belcher, looking about her and sniffing suspiciously. A pretty place enough, but full of malaria, or I'm a Dutchwoman. And what a horrible silence! Malaria, said Mr. Rogers quietly. There's better scent than malaria in this valley, and we're hot on it. Here's the river, and what does the chart say, boy? Five trees, a mile and a half from the creek head? We must have come a mile already. Keep your eyes skinned, and give me a nudge if you see such a clump. But there was no need to keep my eyes skinned. At the next bend of the glade, he and I caught sight of it simultaneously. A clump of noble pines that would have challenged notice, even had we not been searching for them. My heart stood still as I counted them. Yes, there were five. I haven't often wanted to put a knife into a man's back, grunted Mr. Rogers, with a gloomy glance ahead at Dr. Beauregard. For an instant I made sure the doctor had overheard him. He halted suddenly and turned to us with a proprietary wave of the hand towards the trees. A fine group, sirs, is it not? I have often regretted that the cliff yonder just cuts off the view of it from my windows. Indeed, I had almost altered the site of the house to include it. But health before everything, hey, ladies? There is always a certain amount of fever in these valleys, and you will own, presently, that the site I prepared has its compensations. He resumed his way past the trees, and, a quarter of a mile beyond them, past an angle of the cliff where the ridge bent sharply back from the river and revealed a narrow gorge, its entrance choked with pines, running up towards the mountain. Here he paused again, and with another wave of the hand. High on the right of the gorge, on a plateau, above the dark pine tops, a white painted house looked down on us, a long, low house with a generous spread of shadow under its veranda, and a dazzle of light where the upper windows took the sun. End of chapter 32《Chapter 33 of Poison Island》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah. — Poison Island by Sir Arthur Thomas Quiller Couch — Chapter 33 — We Find the Treasure I've a strong sense of the right of property, said Miss Belcher, sipping her tea. We had gathered in Dr. Beauregard's deep veranda at the corner where it took the late afternoon sunshine. The level rays sparkled on the silver and delicate Worcester china of the doctor's tea equipage and fell through the open French window into the doctor's drawing room. A wonderful room it was, as everything in the house was wonderful, a spacious, airy room, furnished in white and gold, with Dresden figures on the mantel shelf, Venetian mirrors, dainty watercolors sunk into the panels, cases of rare books, among them, as I remember, a set of the Cabinet des Fees, bound in rose-colored Morocco and stamped with the royal arms of France, stands of music, and a priceless harpsichord inlaid with ivory. Next to the airiness of the house, which stood high above reach of the valley mists with their malaria, what most sharply impressed me, and the ladies in particular, was its exquisite cleanliness. Yet Dr. Beauregard assured us that he kept but one servant, 
the negress rosa at her master's call she had appeared in the veranda above us as we mounted the last terrace towards the house and had stood there watching our ascent with no trace of surprise or indeed of any emotion whatever on her black inscrutable face her eyes met mine as though she had never seen me before to her care dr beauregard had given over the still unconscious glass and with a sign to mr rogers and mr goodfellow to follow her with their burden she had led the way through the house to the bedroom at the back there in a bed between spotlessly clean sheets they had laid the patient and been dismissed by her it was she who less than ten minutes later had brought our tea to us in the veranda and with our tea many little plates heaped with small cakes and sweetmeats all fresh as though she had been expecting us for hours and could command the resources of a city i kept a sharp lookout but of the strange lady the lady of the graveyard i could detect no trace nothing indicated her presence unless it were the dainty feminine furniture of the drawing-room i've a strong sense of the right of property said miss belcher sipping her tea and touching the oilskin wrapper which lay in her lap unopened as dr branscombe had handed it to her and so has jack rogers here you tell me sir that you hold mortalone by grant and doubtless you can show your title willingly madame dr beauregard rose and stepped to the french window you can read spanish he asked turning there and pausing not a word answered miss belcher the doctor smiled it would impart nothing if you could said he with a smile for i will own to you frankly that mortalone has always been under suspicion of containing treasure and in the grant all treasure trove is expressly reserved i cannot say he added smiling again that i have strictly observed the clause but as between you and me it legally disposes of my claim thank you said miss belcher but i don't own an equally tender conscience towards governments here mr rogers winked at me for as a patron of smugglers miss belcher enjoyed some reputation even for a cornish landowner we will leave government out of the question but as proprietor lord of the manor as we should say at home you have a right to your share and that by english law which i suggest we follow is one-third dr beauregard bowed i'm infinitely obliged to you ma'am and i make no doubt that what you so generously promise you will as honorably give when i claim it in truth i have something more than enough for my needs there was a time i will confess when i had sold my soul if i possessed such a thing for a glimpse of what lies written on that parchment but i am old and old age he broke off the sentence and did not resume it but went on presently with a change of tone however i still keep a sporting interest in the treasure which has baffled me all these years the more so because i have a shrewd suspicion that it has lain all the while within a mile or so of where we sit at this moment it does sir said miss belcher unfolding the chart and pointing dr beauregard adjusted a pair of gold-rimmed eyeglasses and bent towards it the writing was indistinct and he put out a hand as if to take hold of the edge of the parchment and steady it the hand i noticed did not tremble at all stay a moment sir miss belcher turned the chart over the clue is given here upon the back listen and she translated eight bank of river a mile and a half up from gow creek center tree in clump of five branch bearing north and half a point east two forks my trees exclaimed the doctor you remember my halting and pointing them out to you ah yes and i too remember now that you appeared to be disconcerted you recognized them of course yes we recognized them miss belcher admitted but let me finish right fork four feet red cave under hill four hundred and seventy-five yards from foot of tree 
north-northwest. The stones here, under rock four spans, left side. Which means, I suppose, that the cave lies some way up the face of the rock and can only be seen by climbing out upon the right fork of the tree, and that the stones, that is to say the jewels, are hidden under a rock to the left, which rock either measures four spans or lies four spans within the entrance of the cave. I know of no such cave, ma'am, said Dr. Beauregard, bending his brows, though, to be sure, the cliff is of a reddish color thereabouts, due to a drip of water and the growth of some small fungus. I was a fool, said Captain Branscombe, to leave the tools in the gig. If we go back to fetch them, sunset will be upon us before we get to work. The doctor rose with a smile. You might have guessed, sir, that I am not unprovided with spades and picks, or with ropes and a ladder, which also I foresee we shall need. Come, if you have drunk your tea, I will ask you to follow me into the house, the ladies included, and choose your outfit. They went in after him. I was in the act of following. I had, in fact, taken a couple of steps towards the French window, when a slight shiver seemed to run through my hair, and I stood still. Little boy! The words came in a whisper from the end of the veranda. I stole back, and leaning well across the rail, peering around the corner of the house. "'Little boy!' whispered the voice again, and I saw the little lady of the graveyard. She was standing close back against the sideboarding, her body almost flattened against it. "'Come!' she whispered, beckoning with a timid glance over her shoulder towards the rear of the house. I looked at her for a second or two and shook my head. "'But you must come,' she insisted, still in a whisper, and took a step or two as if to entice me after her. Then she halted, and, seeing that I made no motion to follow, came tiptoeing back. "'If you do not come,' she said, "'he will kill you. He will certainly kill you all.' She nodded vehemently, and so, after another glance to right and left, beckoned to me once again. Her face was white, almost as her muslin frock, and something in it persuaded me to climb over the veranda rail and follow her. About fifty yards from the corner of the house stood a clump of odorous laurels, the scent of which we had been inhaling while we sat at tea. For these she broke away at a run, nor looked back until she was well within their shadow and I had overtaken her. "'Good boy,' she said, nodding again and smiling at me, with her desperately anxious face. I would wish, I would very much wish, to kiss you. But you must not come anear, she sighed. It is not healthy. Only you come with me. I dream of you sometimes, all last night. What a pity, I dream, and you so pretty, boy. Now you come with me, and I take you away, so he never find you. The woman was evidently mad. Please tell me what you have to say, I urged, and let me go back. They will be missing me in a minute or so. If they miss you, it is no matter now. He will kill them all. He is so strong, as he killed all those others, you remember? See, now, pretty boy, what I have done for you, to save you from him. He shut me up, in his other house. He has another house away up in the woods, beyond where we met. She waved a hand toward the hills, but I break out and come here to save you. He would kill me also if he knew. Mad, though I believed her, I was growing pretty thoroughly frightened, remembering the graveyard under the trees. You forget my friends, said I, speaking very simply, as to a child. If he means to kill them, I ought to carry them warning. He will not kill them till tonight, she answered, shaking her head. It is always at night-time when they are at supper. There is no hurry, little boy, but he will certainly kill them all the same. I turned my head, preparing to run, for I heard Captain Branscombe's voice in the veranda calling my name. They are starting after the treasure. I must go, I stammered. She drew close and laid a hand on my arm. 
again a dreadful odor was wafted under my nostrils an odor as of tuberoses and i know not what of corruption and as before in the graveyard it turned me both sick and giddy they will not find it she said nodding with an air of childish triumph shall i tell you why i have hidden it here she fell back on her old litany he would kill me if he knew i hid it oh years ago but come and i will show you and you shall take a great deal yes as much as you can carry if only you will go away and never be rash again a second time i heard captain branscombe's voice calling to me demanding to know where i had disappeared she put a finger to her lips smiling such treasure you never did see even rosa does not know come little boy she pushed her way through the laurels and i followed her the edge of the shrubbery overhung the dry bed of a torrent in the cleft of which when we had lowered ourselves over the edge we were completely hidden from the house from the edge a slope of loose stones ran down to the bottom of the cleft where a thin stream of water trickled the stones slid with me but not dangerously and as we scurried down i in my thick boots she in her diminutive dancing shoes i heard pliny's voice join with captain branscombe's in calling my name but by this time i was committed to the adventure and by and by they desisted supposing as pliny told me later that i had taken french leave again and run off to be the first at the clump of trees we might not climb the slope directly in face of us for by so doing even if it had been accessible which i doubt we should have emerged into view we therefore bent our way to the right up the bottom of the gorge to a narrow tongue of rock dividing it in the shelter of which we mounted the rough stairway of the torrent bed from one flat rock to another until we stepped out upon a shallow plateau where the contour of the hills shut off the house and its terraces we stood as i judged upon the reverse or northern side of that ridge which to the south and west overlooked the valley of the treasure above the plateau a stone-strewn scarp of earth led to the forest which reached to the very summit of the ridge and towards the summit after pausing for a second or two to pant and catch her breath my strange guide continued her climb what is your name little boy i told her and she repeated it once or twice to get it by heart you may call me meta she said he calls me meta always when he is pleased with me and that is almost every day he is kind to me oh yes very kind though terrible of course keep on my left hand harry brooks so the breeze here will not blow from me to you i drew up in a kind of giddiness for that dreadful scent of death had touched me again she too halted with a little cry of dismay and a feeble motion of the hands as if to wring them ah you must keep wide of me that is my suffering harry brooks i cannot bend over a flower but it withers and the butterflies die if they come near my breath and that too is his doing he would be kind to me he said and would inoculate me yes that is his word inoculate me so that no poison could ever harm me he knows the secrets of all the plants and why people die of disease months at a time he used to leave me alone with rosa and go to havana to the hospitals and there he would study till his body was wasted away with work but at the end he would come back bringing visitors oh many visitors for he was rich and the house had room for all there were singers he loves music and men who played all day at cards and women who made me jealous but he would only laugh and say wait little one so i waited and in the end they all died rosa said it was the yellow fever but no she held up both hands and made pretense to pour something from an imaginary bottle into an imaginary glass he can kill with one tiny drop in his study 
He keeps a machine which makes water into ice. Rosa would carry round the ice with little glasses of curaco after the coffee was served, and all would say, What wonders are these? Ice in Mort alone? And would drink his health. But he never touched the ice. You tell that to your friends, little boy. But it will not save them, for he will find some other way. As we went up the woods, these awful confidences poured from her like childish prattle, interrupted only by little ripples of laughter, half shy, half silly, and altogether horrible to hear. I hung back, divided between the impulse to tear myself away and the fearful fascination of listening, between the urgent need to find and warn my friends and the forlorn hope to extract from her something that might save them. The toil of the climb had bathed me in sweat, and yet I shivered. I halted. We were close under the summit of the ridge, and had reached a passing clearing where, between the trees, as I turned about, I could see the whole gorge in shadow at my feet, the sunlight warm on its upper eastern slopes, and beyond these the sea. In half an hour, in twenty minutes maybe, I might reach the valley there below, and at least cry my warning. I faced round again to my companion. She had vanished. My mouth grew dry of a sudden. Was she a ghost? And her prattling talk, the voice yet singing in my brain. Little boy, little boy. I parted the tall ferns. Beyond them a small hand beckoned, and following it I came face to face with a wall of naked rock from which she lifted aside the creepers over a deep cleft, a cleft wide enough to admit a man's body if he turned sideways and stooped a little. She clapped her hands at my astonishment. "'You like my bower?' she asked gleefully. "'Ah, but wait, and I will show you wonders. No one knows of it, not even Rosa.' She wiggled her way through the cleft. I peered in and went after her cautiously, expecting, as the curtain of creepers fell behind me, to find myself in a dark cave or grotto. Dark it was, to be sure, but not utterly dark, and, to my amazement, as my eyes grew accustomed to the gloom, the faint light came from ahead of me and seemed to strike upwards from the bowels of the earth. Do not be afraid, little boy, but hold your head low and look to your feet now, for it is steep hereabouts. Steep indeed it was, a kind of shaft, floored for the most part with slippery earth, but here and there with an irregular stairway of rock, and still at the lower end of the tunnel shone a faint light. I would have given worlds by this time to retrace my steps. A slight draught blowing up the tunnel from my companion to me bore the odor of death upwards under my nostrils. But this, while it dizzied and sickened me, seemed to clog my feet and take away all will to escape. I had nearly swooned, indeed, when my feet encountered level earth again, and she put out a hand to steady me. Is, is this the end? It goes down, down, little boy, but we need not follow it. See, there is light. To the left of you, light and fresh air and my pretty bower. I turned as her hand guided me. A puff of wind blew on my cheek, cold and infinitely pure. I stood blinking in a short gallery that ended suddenly in blue sky, and, staggering forward, I cast myself down on the brink. It was as though I lay on the sill of a great open window. Below me, far below, waved great masses of forest, and beyond these, far beyond, shone the blue sea. I cannot say to what depth the cliff fell away below me. It was more than sheer, it was undercut. I lay as one suspended over the void. But see, pretty boy, did I not promise you wonders? As I faced around to the darkness of the gallery, she held aloft something which, for the moment, I mistook for a great green snake, with lines of fire running from scale to scale, and sparkling as she waved it before me. I rolled over upon my elbow and stared. It was a rope of emeralds. She flung an end over one shoulder 
and looped it low over her breast. Then, passing the other end about her neck, she brought it forward over the same shoulder and let it dangle. It reached almost to her feet. "'Does it become me, little boy?' She made me a mock curtsy that set the gems dancing with fire. "'Come and choose, then.' She put out both hands to the darkness by the wall, and a whole cascade of jewels came sliding down and poured themselves with a rush about her feet and across the floor of the gallery. She laughed and thrust her hands again into the heap. "'All these I found, I myself, and carried up here from the darkness. Take what you will, little boy, and run back to your ship. Is it diamonds you will choose, or rubies, or, see here, this chain of pearls?' I do not like pearls for my part. They mean sorrow. But see here again. There were boxes and boxes, all heaped to the brim, and long robes sewn all over with pearls. Take what you like. He will not know. He gives me diamonds sometimes. I adored them in the old days in opera. And he remembers and gives me a stone from time to time to keep me amused. I laugh to myself then when I think of the store I keep here in my bower. And he's so clever, but he does not guess. Ah, child, if I had had but these to wear when I used to sing Eurydice. She held out two handfuls of diamonds and began to sing in a high, cracked voice while she let them rain through her fingers. But listen, I cried suddenly. She ceased at once and stood with her face half turned to the darkness behind her her arms rigid at her sides, the gems dropping as her hand slowly unclasped them. Below, where the tunnel ran down into the darkness, a voice hailed, Meta! Is that Meta? It was the voice of Dr. Beauregard. The poor creature gazed at me helplessly and ran for the stairway, but her feet sank in the loose heap of jewels. She stumbled, and as she picked herself up, I saw that she was too late for already a light shone up from the tunnel below, and before she could gain the exit the doctor stood there, lifting a torch, in the light of which I saw Mr. Rogers close behind his shoulder. Meta! I do not think he would have hurt her, but as the torch flared in her face and lit up the shining heap of jewels, she threw up both hands and doubled back, screaming. I believed that she called me to hide, I put out a hand to catch her by the skirt, seeing that she ran madly, but the thin muslin tore in my clutch. Meta! On the ledge, against the sky, the voice seemed to overtake and steady her for a second, but too late. With a choking cry, she put out both hands against the void and toppled forward, and in the entrance was nothing but the blue, empty sky. End of chapter 33《ハッピーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバーバ He is dead. Rosa brought me the news before we sat down to table. I opened my eyes. In the words, as I came back to consciousness, I found nothing remarkable, nor for a few seconds did it surprise me that the dark gallery had changed into a paneled, lighted room with candles shining on a long white table and on flowers and crystal decanters and dishes heaped with fruit. The candles were shaded. And from the sofa where I lay, I saw across the cloth the faces of Miss Belcher and Captain Branscombe intent on the doctor. He was leaning forward from the head of the table and speaking to Pliny, who sat with her back to me, darkly silhouetted against the light. Mr. Rogers, on Pliny's left, had turned his chair sideways and was listening too, and at the lower end of the board, A tall epergue of silver partially hid the form of Mr. Goodfellow. Yes, indeed, I ought to have told you, 
went on the doctor's voice, but really no recovery could be expected. The man's heart was utterly diseased. His gaze, traveling past Pliny, wandered as if casually towards me, where I lay in the penumbra. I felt it coming, and closed my eyes, and on the instant my brain cleared. Yes, Glass was dead, of course, poisoned by this man, as ruthlessly as these my friends would be poisoned if I cried out no warning. Or perhaps it had already happened. I opened my eyes again, cautiously, little by little. The doctor was filling Pliny's glass. Having filled it, he pushed the decanters towards Mr. Rogers and turned to say a word to Miss Belcher on his right. No, there was time. It had not happened, yet. I wanted to start up and scream aloud, but some power stronger than my will held me down against the sofa cushion. I had lost all grip of myself of my voice and limbs alike. I could neither stir nor speak, but lay watching with half-closed eyes, while the room swam, and in my ears I heard a thin voice buzzing. Tell your friends, the ice. He never touches the ice, but it will not save them. He will find some other way. The door opened, and its opening broke the spell. On the threshold stood the tall negress with a tray of coffee cups, and, on the tray, a salver with a number of little glasses and a glass bowl, a bowl of ice. Her master pushed back the decanters to make room for the tray before him. She set it down, and the little glasses jingled softly. "'Upon my word, sir,' said Miss Belcher, "'what wonder upon wonders is this? Ice? And in Mort alone? "'It is Rose's little surprise, madame, and she will be gratified by your... He pushed back his chair and, leaving the sentence unfinished, rose swiftly and came to me as I staggered up from the sofa. A cry worked in my throat, but before I could utter it, his two hands were on my shoulders, and he had appealed to the company with a triumphant little laugh. Did I not tell you the child would come to himself all right? A simple sedative, after the fright he had. He's trembling now, poor boy. No, ma'am, he turned to Pliny, who had risen and was coming forward solicitously. Let him sit upright for a moment while he comes to his bearings, or, better still, when you have finished your coffee, if Miss Belcher will be kind enough to pour it out for me, we will take him out into the fresh air. Yes, yes, and the sooner the better, for I see that Mr. Rogers is fidgeting to be out and assure himself that the treasure has not taken wings. He forced me gently back to my seat and walked to the table. What were we saying? Ah, yes, to be sure, about the ice. He lifted his coffee cup with a steady hand, and his eyes traveling over it fixed themselves on me, as though to make sure I was recovering. The ice is a surprise of roses, and I assure you she is proud of it, but— you may go, Rosa. I advise you to content yourself with wondering, for the water on these hills, strange to say, is not healthy. They voted the doctor's advice to be good, and, having finished their coffee, wandered out into the fresh air. Pliny took my arm, and, leading me to the veranda, found me a comfortable seat, where I could recline and compose myself, for I was trembling yet." They have stacked the treasure there beyond the last window, Pliny informed me, nodding towards the end of the veranda, where Captain Branscombe, Mr. Rogers, and Mr. Goodfellow were already gathered and busy in conversation. In bulk, it is less than we expected, but in value, the doctor says, it goes beyond everything. Three hundred weight, they say, and in pure gems. He is to choose his share, by and by, and then we have to contrive how to take it down to the ship. "'Miss Plinlimmon,' said the captain, coming towards us, "'you promised me a word yesterday. I should wish to claim it now. That is, if Harry can spare you.' I observed that his voice shook a little, but this I set down to excitement. "'Did I? Yes, I remember.' Miss Plinlimmon's voice, too, was tremulous. She hesitated, and her eyes in the dim light seemed to seek mine. 
I assured her that I was recovering fast, here in the fresh air, and that it would be a kindness indeed to leave me alone. She bent quickly and kissed me. I wondered why, as she stepped past the captain, and he followed her down the veranda steps. I wished to be left alone. I was puzzled, and what puzzled me was that neither Miss Belcher nor Dr. Beauregard had left the dining-room. In fact, as I passed out, through the window, happening to turn my head, I had caught sight of his face, and it had signaled to her to stay. I knew not why he should intend harm to Miss Belcher rather than to any other of our party, but I distrusted the man, and Pliny had scarcely left me before, having made sure that Mr. Rogers and Mr. Goodfellow were within easy call, I rose up softly, crept to the dining-room window, and dropping upon hands and knees close by the wall, peered into the room. The doctor and Miss Belcher had reseated themselves. He had poured himself out another glass of wine and was holding it up to the light with a steady hand, while she watched him, her elbows on the table and her firm jaw resting on her clasped fingers. Her face, though it showed no sign of fear, was pallid. Yes, he was saying slowly, it is too late at this hour to be discussing what the priests would call the sin of it. You would never convince me. And if you convinced me, I am too old and too weary for what the priests call repentance. I am Martin, the same man that outwitted Malhuish and his crew, the same that played Harry with this glass, and the man Coffin, and a drunken old ruffian they brought with them from Wida, the fools, to think to frighten me, that had started by laying out a whole ship's crew. And now you come along, and I hold you all in the hollow of my palm. But I open my hand, so, and let you go. Why? Why? I have told you, I am tired. That is not all the truth, answered Miss Belcher, eyeing him steadily. No, it is not all the truth. No one tells all the truth in this world. But I am glad you challenge me, for you shall have a little more of the truth. I let you go, because you were simpletons, and I had not dealt with simpletons before. Is that the truth? she persisted. He laughed and sipped his wine. No, I let you go, because I saw in you, I who have killed many for wealth, and more for the mere pleasure of power, something which told me that, after all, I had missed the secret. From an outcast child in Havana, I had made myself the sole king of this treasure of Mortalone. I went back and made slaves of men and women who had tossed that child their coppers in contemptuous pity. I brought them here to Mortalone to play with them, and as soon as they tired me, they went. It was power I wanted, power I achieved, and in power, as I thought, lay the secret. The tools in this world say that a poisoner is always a coward. It is one of the phrases with which fools cheat themselves. For long I was sure of myself, and then when the thought began to haunt me that, after all, I had missed the secret, I sought out the man who, in Europe, had made himself more powerful than kings, and I found that he had missed the secret too. Then I guessed that the secret is beyond a man's power to achieve, unless it be innate in him, that the gods themselves cannot help a man born in bastardy, as I was, or born with a vulgar soul, as was Napoleon. One chance of redemption he has, to mate with a woman who has, and has known from birth, the secret which he has missed. I guessed it, I that had wasted my days with singing, women such as poor Meta, then I met you, and I knew. Yes, madame, you. You, whose life tonight I had almost taken with a touch, taught me that I had left women out of account. Ah, madame, if the world were twenty years younger, will you do me the honor to touch glasses and drink with me? Not on any account, said Miss Belcher, rising, not to put too fine a point upon it, you make me feel thoroughly sick. But she hesitated on the threshold of the window. The worst of it is, I think, 
I understand you a little. I drew back into the shadow. Her stiff skirt almost struck me on the cheek as she passed, and crossing the veranda, leant with both hands on the rail, while her face went up to the sky and the newly risen moon. A voice spoke to her from the moonlit terrace below. Hello, she answered. Is that Captain Branscombe? It is, ma'am, and Miss Plinlimmon, Amelia, as she allows me to call her. Miss Belcher cut him short with a laugh. It rang out frank and free enough, and only I, crouching by the wall, understood the hysterical springs of it. You two geese, she exclaimed, and ran down the steps to them. Was that Lydia? demanded Mr. Rogers, a moment later, as he came along the veranda. It was, I answered. I don't understand these people, grumbled Mr. Rogers, pausing and scratching his head. There was to have been a meeting outside here, directly after supper, to divide off Dr. Beauregard's share, but confound it if every one doesn't seem to be playing hide-and-seek. Where's the doctor? In the dining-room, said I, nodding towards the window. He stepped towards it. At that moment I heard a dull thud within the room, and Mr. Rogers, his foot already on the threshold, drew back with a cry. I ran to his elbow. On the floor, stretched at her master's feet, lay the negress Rosa. Dr. Beauregard stood by the corner of the table and poured himself a small glass of curacoa. While we gazed at him, he reached out a hand to the ice bowl, selected a small piece, and dropped it delicately into the glass. I heard it tingle against the rim. "'Your good health, sirs,' said Dr. Beauregard. He sat back rigid in his chair." End of chapter 34 End of Poison Island by Sir Arthur Thomas Quiller Couch 